this session of Look at the Book, we're going to focus on the first seven words of the book. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. But let me read the rest of it. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, I pray that as we focus on Paul's self-identity here, why he includes Timothy with him, what it means that they are servants of Christ Jesus, that you would make us like these men the way they intend to model Jesus Christ. We want to honor Christ. We want to learn from Paul. We want to be like Timothy as he embodies so much of what this letter is. Help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul and Timothy, servants. Ordinarily, Paul would put apostle. He is an apostle of Christ Jesus. Apostle is a, a term of authority. It, uh, I just, I'm going to take you to a few places to illustrate Paul's authority just because he's writing with that same authority, even though he doesn't name himself an apostle there. So here's Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle, apostle, a sent one authorized by the risen Christ, an apostle, not from men. I didn't get my authority from men, not through man. I wasn't called through man, but through Jesus Christ. The risen Christ made Paul his authoritative spokesman. Here's verse 11. I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel, for I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Christ. That's the sense that an apostle has. Here's the authority that he has as he expresses it in 1 Corinthians 14. If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or a spiritual or sh he should acknowledge that the things that I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, that I'm speaking for the Lord, he is not recognized. That's an amazing statement and would be utterly arrogant if Christ had not laid hold on Paul and commissioned him as his inspired authoritative spokesman. Here's back in Galatians 1 to show further his authority. When he who had set me apart before I was born, Paul did not sign up for this job. This cost him his life. He suffered continually. He was laid hold on by God in the womb for this job. And then he called him by his grace on the Damascus road. And then he revealed his son to him so that he might preach him among the Gentiles. And he didn't consult with anyone. So the point is that his authority was strong and full and deep as an apostle, even though he names himself here a servant. So let's ask, what does he want us to understand by servant? Paul and Timothy, servants, douloi, slaves. Well, look at what he says here in 1 Corinthians 7, 22 and 23. When he, for he who was called in the Lord as a slave, so if you got saved as a slave in that day, you should think of yourself as a freedman of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called, if you got saved when you were free, then he is a slave of Christ. Now, what does that mean? You were bought with a price. Don't become slaves of men. So to be a slave was to be bought and owned. And Christ is the one who bought us and he owns us. And therefore, there's an amazing freedom from men. Here's what he says in Galatians 1.10. Am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I, my, am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a, a slave, a servant of Christ. So to be a servant of Christ is to not please man, but to please Christ. And if you ask, does 
slavery imply that we meet God's needs? Did he need slaves because he, he had, to, had to have some slave labor help? No, that's not the way Paul thought about it at all. Look at Romans 6, 20 and 22. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit did you get from that time? What fruit did you get? What fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? So you weren't getting any benefit from your slavery. So he seems to think in terms of do you get any benefit from being a slave of somebody? And, and the answer is yes, God, for the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, that's the verb form of slavery, to become a slave, the fruit you get, you get fruit by being a slave is sanctification and its end eternal life. So in Paul's mind, to be a slave of God was to be a beneficiary, not a benefactor. He's not benefiting God. God is benefiting him by taking Paul on as a servant. So Paul, a servant of God. Christ Jesus. But there's one big important reason for why he uses this, I think, here. This word is used in Philippians only one other time, namely right here in one of the most important passages in the book about the kind of people Paul is trying to create. Have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he, Jesus, was in the form of God and did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So the one other place where it's used is of Christ, who though he is equal with God, in the very form of God, humbles himself and becomes a servant and dies for us. And he says, you have this mind in you. And so he identifies himself as one of those to set an example of the very thing he's trying to teach in this book. Now, what about Timothy? Why mention Timothy here? Did Timothy write the book? Who, who actually wrote the book? Well, the word I occurs in this book 42 times. And the word me or my occurs in this book about 40 times. And the word we in this book never refers to Paul and Timothy and we know that Paul refers to Timothy in the third person, like in chapter 2, verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy. So Paul, I, is talking about Timothy in the third person. So Timothy is not writing the book. Paul is writing the book. He tells his own story in this, in this book. Chapter 1, verse 3. I... Thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Verse 9. And it is my prayer for you all. Verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me. So this is Paul writing this book. Timothy's not the writer here. Paul is the writer. So why include Timothy? And I don't know for sure, but Here's my suggestion. Timothy figures one other time in this book in a huge way. Namely, right here, chapter 2, verse 19 to 24. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your 
welfare. They all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know, so they knew Timothy. You know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with the Father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how things would go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. So he has no one like Timothy. The reason there's no one like him is because he gets outside of himself and is concerned about other people's welfare. They know how he has served. So my suggestion is that uh, Paul referred to Timothy here at the beginning because Timothy so beautifully embodies the very thing Paul wants to bring about. So Paul himself wants to be a humble servant of the Philippians like Jesus was of us. Timothy has clearly proven himself to be a servant, and that's where this whole book is going. So in the very first, what, seven verses, what we've seen is that this book is from Paul, and it is aiming at producing people like Timothy, namely who are servants of Christ, which means also taking thought for the interests of others and not just for the interests of themselves.